All right, Galatians chapter 3, um, chapter 1 and 2 concluded Paul's defense of his apostleship. And in chapter 2, um, we notice that he got into a little bit of the detail concerning the content of his gospel. Namely, notice in verse 15 when he was talking to Peter, he said, We are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Um, We know what that means, but Paul is giving us detail in chapter 3. The fact that we are justified by faith in Christ is the whole purpose of the letter. Because some are saying, no, you're justified by keeping the works of the law. So the fact that we're justified by faith is under consideration in Galatians chapter 3, and through chapter 4, he'll give a number of defenses of his position that we are justified by faith. This is the gospel validated through the truth of his apostleship. His origin of apostleship is from God, and the apostles were those who gave him fellowship and therefore endorsed his apostleship. And in chapter 3, this is what the content of his gospel actually is. And what we're going to see tonight is, I put it into five divisions, and the outline that you have that Brother Copeland supplied us with, you'll see a little bit of a difference, but I'm going to divide it into five sections, five points that he's going to make. And then JT will pick up with a continuation of the last point, which has to do with our airship in Christ and not being by the works of the law as physical or of Christ of the seed of Abraham by faith. And then there's a couple of other points to establish the gospel of justification by faith in chapter four. So we'll get into the text. And the first um, thing that he appeals to, to uh, defend the gospel, which is justification by faith in contrast to being justified by keeping the works of the law, is the Galatians' own experience. And so he speaks about, um, first of all, their departure from the gospel, as he did in chapter 1, calls them foolish, says they've been bewitched, and then he's going to ask a number of questions, which brings to remembrance their beginning of their walk with Christ and their being justified and having the hope of salvation that should lead them logically to the reasoning and conclusion that it was unwise to ever listen to these Judaizing teachers because what they're teaching is obviously false, and we can know that by our own experience. He calls them foolish Galatians. Why does he call them foolish Galatians? Why are they so foolish? They're turning to another gospel, a gospel that does not make sense. That's why it's not another. It does not harmonize with what Paul had originally taught. Um, I believe it was uh, Kurt that at least introduced the point when I was teaching in chapter 1 that it it may not have been necessarily the case that Paul went into detail about circumcision and why that's not necessary and such when he first taught the Galatians, that this was something that came to be a problem in the future But what they were equipped to understand is that this doctrine now that is binding a work of the law of Moses cannot be true based on what we know is true, having been taught by God. And so he calls them foolish. It's a word which has to do with um, not perceiving or understanding. And so they were not thinking straight. It signifies to be senseless and unworthy uh, lack of understanding. And so that kind of matches up with this idea of them being bewitched. They were duped. They were ones who were put under a charm, if you will, a spell. Um, it, it was that which meant to bring evil on a person by feigned praise or mislead by an evil eye, and so to charm and bewitch. It's used figuratively in Galatians 3, 1 vine says, of leading into evil doctrine. You notice in chapter 4, in verse 17, he'll talk about how these Judaizers are zealously courting them so that they can exclude them from Paul, is the implication, so that they may be zealous for them. And so they're, they're using what we see throughout the New Testament 
that false teachers use and persuasive speech and flattering speech and, and eloquence and human wisdom. And so it's not that there was good reason in their doctrine, but the Galatians were swayed by their deceptive ways. So what does he say that they were bewitched to not do? Or depending on your translation, what does he say next? That was a really awesome question that I just asked, wasn't it? So in the New King James Version, um, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And then he speaks about before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This phrase that you should not obey the truth is supplied, or, or not supplied rather, in other manuscripts. Uh, evidently, there's not much textual support for it, but it is an implication that is in the text. So that's one of our first questions. How was Christ portrayed among them as crucified? Harry had a lesson on this a couple of months ago. I don't know if you remember, but he used this text. Was there a painting given to them? Was there a video recording of the crucifixion? What's that? Through what medium, if you will? The preaching. The message of the cross, right. The word portrayed is prographo, and it means before and grapho to write. And so Arton Gingrich says, uh, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was portrayed on a cross, many would prefer to translate um, placard publicly, set forth in a public pro- proclamation, so all may read. He said, we determined not to know anyone, anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified in First Corinthians chapter 2. That's, that's what he's saying. And that's the point, is that as we mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 4, the heart of the gospel is the sacrifice of Christ. And that was preached to you. Now, that was clear before, that you can't be justified except for, for the sacrifice of Christ. Why now are you turning to a system which, as he says in chapter 2 and verse 21, sets aside the grace of Christ, God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You see that? You are turning away from the truth, and that is extremely foolish. It's very clear by the gospel. The most important fact of the gospel is Christ crucified on behalf of you for the remission of your sins. And so they've turned away, but here's why he says they've turned away, and or, or rather, here's why he is, he is saying what they did in turning away um, was unwise. He jogs their memory about their experiences. And he first says, did you receive the Spirit by the law or by the hearing of faith? What's the answer? Hearing of faith. That's throughout this section is the answer that is, it goes without saying. He doesn't need to, to make that, um, that answer they, they know, and that's the point. Now, he speaks about receiving the Spirit. You notice in verse 5 he mentioned supply of the Spirit and works of miracles. I think that there's a distinction between, to be made between that and what we just read in verse 2. I think that it's general enough that it could include the working of miracles, But I think the reason it doesn't include that in verse 2 is because he mentions it in verse 5. And so the reception of the Spirit, I believe, had to do with their fellowship of the Spirit, as we read in Philippians 2 and verse 1. Their communion of the Holy Spirit that we read of in 2 Corinthians 13 and in verse uh, verse 14. Uh, Hebrews 6 talks about those who had been enlightened and had become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 3 of Hebrews, he talks about being a partaker of Christ. And when we think about being a partaker of Christ, what, what does that mean? What does partaker mean? Koinonos. It's also translated what in other passages? Fellowship, right? So it has to do with participation. What does he mean that we're a partaker of Christ? Does that mean he's inside of us, literally? Does that mean that we're necessarily those who are endowed with miraculous gifts. Okay, we put on Christ. You see that at the end of Galatians 3. We participate with him. In the gospel, he's our elder brother. We have the blessings of Christ and his sacrifice. And so I think it's the same way in regard to receiving the Spirit in verse 2, or as Hebrews 6 mentions um, in verses 4 and 5, being partakers of the Holy Spirit. When you obey the gospel, you join in fellowship with the Spirit's teaching, uh, with His identifying you as a child of God, 
with the blessings that are bestowed. And so he'll say in chapter 5 that they're to be walking in the Spirit. And I think that's the idea. You've then gone into verse 3, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the beginning in the Spirit was when they obeyed the gospel, the truth through the Spirit, First Peter 1 says, and now have begun to walk in relation with the Spirit according to the Spirit's teaching. And in that action, they are those who have become children of God and now are to be perfected or brought to maturity by submitting to the Spirit. And so the point seems to be very briefly that he is speaking about their fellowship with the Spirit and his blessings. And then the continuation of that should be being perfected or brought to maturity by the Spirit. But as you began in the Spirit, now you're going backwards and you're trying to be perfected by the works of the law. How much sense does that make? You're born of the Spirit. Why? Because you could not be justified by the works of the law. So you get that out of the way. Now you're going back as if now you can, having been born of the Spirit, now be perfected by the works of the law. They understood that wasn't the case, and that's why he's bringing it to their memory. Or what does he bring up? Suffering. Why were they suffering? Why did they suffer? Past tense. For Christ. When we obey the gospel, what's promised us? I, I think it was Sunday that Harry had a point on this in his lesson. Persecution, suffering. Uh, notice in chapter 5 what Paul will say in verse 11. I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. There's an offense of the cross. When I preach the truth, Paul is saying, based on that and those that are opposed to it, I will be persecuted. Now, if I preach uh, circumcision, you didn't get that from me, but if I was preaching circumcision, I wouldn't be suffering. But he says in chapter 6, I bear the marks of the Lord. And so they had suffered. When, when they obeyed the gospel, they faced opposition and suffered. But what does he say about that? Have you suffered in what? Why would it have been in vain? They went back. Right? I'm, I am so committed to something and and convinced and convicted in something that I am willing to suffer and die for it. And what good is that? Peter says that you're blessed. The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, First Peter 4. Um, Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes, you're blessed. You, you're content. That's a blessed state because you're right with God and that's manifested by suffering for his cause. But if you did that here and you went backwards, what good will that do you? Not any at all. In Hebrews 6, he talked about uh, remembering their previous good works. God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. But what if you continue down that path and you uh, crucify again afresh the Son of God and you turn away from that and put him to an open shame? Will the past good works mean anything for you? No, they'll be in vain. So they, they go back and they erase it. And so lastly in verse 5, he mentioned the Spirit again. Now, I think the difference is where they receive the Spirit in verse 2, he speaks about one who is God supplying the Spirit, and that's when he adds these workings of miracles. Now, what, does, what do miracles do? <laughs> they, they do what? Say, someone say it again. Yep. Confirm the word. I ask a question, don't say anybody, and everyone. It's good, though. It's good, though. We want participation. They confirm the word. Uh, not long ago, we studied from 1 Corinthians 12, and there were two purposes, revelation and confirmation. And so if someone is teaching Judaizing error, would they have been able to work miracles confirming that message? No, because the Spirit decides who he's working through, right? And he would never work through one teaching error, would he? And so you see the point. When he says by, is it by the hearing of faith? or by the keeping of the law. It's the Greek word ek, and it has to do with origin. Uh, from what did the Spirit's fellowship originate? Did you come into fellowship with God, the Spirit, through the keeping of the law? No. You, you were proven that you couldn't do that. It came by the hearing of faith. When miracles were worked among you, did it come out of, originate from the preaching of the law of Moses and binding of those things? No, it came from the preaching of of 
of the gospel and you heard it and had faith. Comments, questions on that? That's one of those that had some technical things to it. Well, I think uh, JT pointed out on Sunday uh, when he says in verse 14 of chapter 2, I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, the point is not that Peter was teaching error. The point is that Peter was not living truth. There's a vast difference between the two. In fact, he mentions that these men came from James, and it's speculation on whether this event that he speaks about at the end of chapter 2 happened before or after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. But regardless, it seems that there is at least the possibility those people that came from James who are implied to be Judaic teachers may have been sent by him or at least endorsed by him in some way. James had something to do with this as well. Um, but the point is that Peter was not teaching error. He was not living in the way that the truth would continue in success. And so, in, in him in living that way and espousing error by his actions, uh, certainly God would not endorse it through any miraculous gifts. That's a good question. All right, let's go to the next point. He speaks then of justification by faith with the example or precedent of Abraham. If Abraham was justified by this way, and all people are going to be justified in the same way Abraham was, then it can't be by the works of the law because what? It was justified how? By faith. He quotes Genesis 15 and verse 6. He says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. There's a lot. We could have a whole sermon on this one verse. But the point is that the belief of Abraham, his faith, was put to his account. That's the idea of accounted, logizomai, to reckon, to take into account, to put down to a person's account. It's his faith, and God credits him with what belongs to him, his faith. Now, that's accounted for, to, or into righteousness. You see that? Here is a prerequisite, a, a presupposition to one being made righteous, forgiven of their sins. And what is the condition? Faith. Abraham believed God, and therefore God could make him righteous. Romans 4 is a good area to study with regard to that, especially when Paul quotes David in Psalm 32. And what he does is he uses David to show the negative of what faith being accounted for to or into righteousness is. And what it is is that when you have faith, now our sins are not put to our account any longer. And so that's a negative. Being righteous before God means I'm not in sin. I'm right before him. I'm just before him. That's how Abraham was justified, so he makes application of that. He says, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And then he mentions the foresight of the Scripture. The Scripture, what did the Scripture see happening ahead of time that influenced what was revealed? All the nations, the justification of the Gentiles. Uh, as we noticed in our study of Isaiah, nations always has reference to the Gentiles. Nation may have reference to Israel, but nations has reference to the Gentiles. And that was the point in Genesis 12, 3, and then all the other times that promise was um, repeated. And so God's plan all along was to justify not just those who happened to be of the physical lineage of Abraham, of physical Israel, his, his plan was all the time to justify man in a way that could, in fact, include the Gentiles. And that was by what? Faith. 
And so here's, here's the understanding. When he says in Genesis chapter 12 and in verse 3, to Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, that in and of itself necessarily includes the Gentiles. He doesn't say just your physical descendants, all the nations of the earth. Israel was not just the only nation when Israel came to be a nation. All the nations of the earth. And the reason why it was put that way is because the scripture foresaw, being personified there, God foresaw, it was in God's eternal plan to justify all men one way, that is, by faith. So then what's the conclusion in verse 9? Those who believe. We're blessed with Abraham, and Abraham was blessed by believing. That's the idea, um, that those who are of faith are blessed with believing it, not believing in Abraham, but be, the one Abraham who himself was believing, who had faith. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to leave a lot of meat on the bone. So if you have something you want to talk about, bring it up. Um, I might finish early tonight if we don't do that. Uh, to his point in Romans 4 and verse 13, uh, notice what is said. The promise, and that's what Galatians 3 is going to be talking about. Galatians, uh, Romans 4 and verse 13. The promise that Abraham would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That tells me that Abraham was righteous by faith, and when he believed God initially, we don't, we're not told specifically when Abraham went from lost to, to found, justified. That's what Romans 4 is about, but here's the point. When do we see the promise initially made? When was it made in Genesis? Chapter 12 and verse 3. What was the verse 6 in Galatians 3 a quotation of? He believed God and was counted him right for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. But he's saying he was already justified, made righteous by faith, back in Genesis chapter 12, which is when that promise came in. And we know that because the promise came in by the righteousness of faith, not by the works of the law. So it's to, to Kurt's point. This was not an initial one-time thing, faith only faithful obedience that was throughout his life. And so what what we have to think about when we're talking with our denominational friends is what is the initial point of our being saved? And we would go to a place like Galatians 3 and verses 26 through the end of the chapter when we put on Christ and become heirs. That's when we are saved. 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts 2, 38, Mark 16, 16, you name it, the list goes on. But really what Paul is dealing with in Galatians 3 and in Romans 4 is not our initial point of salvation, but how we ever at any point in continuation stand righteous before God. It is by an obedient faith, and it is this ongoing process. And that's really the point of James chapter 2. If at any point in your life you're, you're just before God, but I decide to not keep this law or do this and therefore sin before God because he prohibits that, then I have not acted by faith, I have disobeyed, and I therefore am not justified before him. But as I continue along, my continued justification and standing right before him, it hangs on whether I act by faith that obeys. Um, so that, that's a continual thing throughout our life, yes. Yes. 
that's an important point because when he says not by works of the law, he's not saying that in a general fashion. He, he's saying the works of the law of Moses because as he says in chapter 6, there is a law we're under, the law of Christ. And as chapter 5 indicates, it's not a liberty to sin, but to live free from sin and submit to the Spirit's teaching. And so it is a submissive and obedient faith. That's the point. Dar. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and that, that's, you know, that's the point from beginning to end that Hebrews 11 talks about. By faith, he was called to go out, and he went. By faith, he received his son as alive from the dead, as raised from the dead, even though that was not even God's purpose. That's, that's the point from beginning to end of his life. He lived by faith. That doesn't mean he was perfect. That means that he complied by the will of God, and, and if he sinned, he met the conditions in penitence uh, to be forgiven of those sins. All right. I'm sure some other stuff will come up as we go along because it all relates. And so the third point he makes in his defense of the gospel of justification by faith has to do with the state that one finds themselves being under the old law. And what is that? That's our, that's our fourth question. What state would one find themselves in under the law and why? Under a curse and why? Didn't keep it perfectly. Here, here's the point, and, and Paul touches on this in Romans is, chapter 7 is what comes to my mind. And it's ironic, Romans is difficult than Galatians 3, uh, or Galatians period, but you can't help but go back and forth, and I know we're familiar with Romans 2. But in Romans 7, he makes the point that the law was to bring life. But how is the only way the law leads to life? Keeping it perfectly. We're not born in sin, we're born upright. There's nothing good or evil inherently within man. And so if I get to the age of accountability and I'm obeying the law and I have not broken the law, I'm alive. I'm dead when I break the law. But no one has ever done that. No one has ever continued throughout their life not breaking the law. And that's the point. When he speaks about the curse of the law, curses everyone who does not continue in all things, that's the point, is that you've got to continue not just in one thing consistently, but all things. And it doesn't matter if you go 40 years, which has happened, I understand, but hypothetically, theoretically, if you go 40 years and you have kept the law perfectly up to that point and you mess up on day one of your 40, that's it. That's it. Without Christ, you're dead. In your sin, you are completely without hope. So you're under a curse. That means, uh, you know, a cause of harm or misery, being separated from God, destined to eternal separation, eternal death. And so no one is justified in the sight of God. He says in verse 11, for what reason? What does he quote in verse 11? The just shall live by faith. Where is that from? Back at 2. It's the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament several times to establish God's means of justification. But that's a powerful point. That no man is justified by the law is clear because the law itself says no man is justified by the law but by faith. The just shall live by faith. Those who are just live by faith and those who are to be just before God get there by faith. Because all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 would not exist if it was me would justify a man by that perfect obedience. That's a powerful point, and it's the same logic that Paul uses in Romans 3 when he quotes that list of Scripture that talks about how sinful the Jews were, and he says that the law is speaking of whoever it addresses, which means all of this talk about sin that was you know, stamped and delivered to you means you are in sin. And so that the Jews were delivered a message from Habakkuk and other places, as we saw in Isaiah, that justification is by faith and not by perfection, tells me that there is no justification by keeping the law perfectly. Sense. All right. Um, and that's the, that's the idea of, you know, the basic and fundamental principle of the harmony of Scripture. It has to harmonize, you know, Passage A cannot contradict passage B. If it does, 
you've got something wrong. And that's his point. You're saying you can be justified by the works of the law. Well, let's see what the law says. The just shall live by faith. Someone's wrong here, and it's not Paul, right? Thomas, questions on that? So we're under a curse under the law, but how do we get out of that? If we're doomed under the law, what's our hope? Well, Christ redeemed us. How did he redeem us? Question five. By becoming a curse for us, but in what way does he say? He died on the tree. Does it say that he opened his account and said, God, you do the accounting and transfer all the sins of mankind over to my account. I'll take it. Christ was never sinful in any way, shape, or form. His point is a vicarious death. His point is not he took the sins to his own account. He bore the penalty, the curse of sin. You sin, you die, you're under a state of misery and damnation. And Christ, not having sin, took that place of death. That's the point. Calvinism is, is obviously false, and that's what this section points out uh, very vividly. And he became a curse that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, one, his sacrifice was not just for those who are Jews, but for the Gentiles. But the very fact that he had to be sacrificed in order for even the Jews demonstrates that it's not by the works of the law, but by another means, faith in that sacrifice that man can be saved, which would include necessarily Gentiles in the promise. Now, number six, what is the promise of the Spirit in verse 14? I won't be able to spend a ton of time on this, but what would you get on that? Anybody? Salvation. I think that's what he's saying. And so it's, a, I think, a parallel to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and 39. Uh, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. For the promise is to you and to your children and those who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Um, or the gift uh, of the You shall receive the gift of the Spirit for the promise is to you and your kin, so on and so forth. And I think the mistake we make is automatically in that phrase thinking that the Spirit is the gift. But if you receive the gift of Jeremiah, that doesn't necessarily mean you receive me as a gift. Maybe Jeremiah is handing out gifts and you receive the gift that he's giving. And I think that's the point. In Acts 2, you might notice when Paul quotes from Joel, to end with, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think that's the point. This is the age of the Spirit. This is that which Joel spoke of, and this is what it ends in. This is the whole focus. This is the promise. And that's that promise there of the Spirit is, is paralleled then um, with the blessing of Abraham, which is obviously that blessing of justification by faith. Yes. revealing that yeah yeah absolutely so whatever promise was made to Abraham back then is what it's talking about here and was always through the son absolutely all right um, so move on from the state under law into the covenant and you probably could split these into two, two sections but they kind of bleed into one another um, and the purpose of the law here's some tricky things we've got what 10 minutes so this may be fast and blurry and some of this um, is things that even brethren disagree on in regard to the specific point that's being made and each has credence to a degree and so I'm not going to be dogmatic on some of this at all. But um, So bear with me. And if you're not happy with my uh, answer or whatever, then feel free to talk to me, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I won't get offended. He says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it, if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Speaking in the manner of men, he's saying this is how men understand. Hebrews 6 has a similar 
statement in regard to a promise and uh, that God went above and beyond to confirm it by two things, uh, the promise and the oath. But he's simply saying that when a covenant is ratified, when an agreement is made between two men, no one annuls it, it doesn't get nullified, and no one can change it after the fact. The agreement is set in stone, it's made. Uh, If anything changes, then it's a different agreement. It's not that same agreement. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And so he's... He's saying this was the original covenant, like Angela was saying. The spirit made this to Abraham back here. It's the same up here. You, you can't change that. And his point ultimately is God made the covenant with Abraham, as he'll say, 430 years before the law even came into effect. And so the law couldn't have changed it. And his point hinges on the difference between seed and seeds. Now, the Hebrew word for seed is zera, and it's a collective noun. And so it's singular at time, most times. In fact, only one time is it in the plural form, but it is a plurality inherently. And so it's the idea of group. There may be a group, singular, but a group implies more than one person. Now, when we think without this context of to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, we think of his descendants, like with the land promise, was not to one person, it was to his descendants. But here's the point. If God would have used the plural, it could not have possibly ended up with one individual. But there is times when the plural noun, or the collective noun rather, is used to refer to one person. For example, in 1 Kings eleven fourteen, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon Hadad, the Edomite. He was a descendant, but it's in the same form uh, of the king in Edom. And so I think the point is, uh, agree or disagree with me, this is the way I'm seeing it. The point is that whether Abraham fully comprehended it or not, because like in 1 Peter 1, we see that the prophets didn't always know what they were even talking about to the degree that we do now with the full revelation. Whether Abraham fully understood it or not, the reason why God said to you and your seed in Genesis uh, chapter 22, I believe, is what he's referring to is because it was to Christ. He identifies it, the Christ, this individual. And so while certainly the Christ comes through the lineage, which had many people, the descendants of Abraham, it was the Christ that was the seed that he was speaking of. Now, in Romans 4, he's making a different argument, and he'll talk about how the seed involves who were of faith in Abraham. That's not the point he's making here, and we see that by the identification of the seed who is Christ. So what, what's the importance there? These Judaizers, the whole idea of um, Judaizing is to compel some to live as Jews. Eudazo is the word used in verse uh, 14 of chapter 2. And why would they think they need to do that? Because the promise is not going to be for anyone except those of the physical seed of Abraham. And if you're a Gentile, you've got to be circumcised and be considered as that seed and keep the law. But what he's arguing here is that it was never about the physical lineage because who would that of necessity include if we're being accurate? Did Abraham have more than one son? Who was the other one? Ishmael, and he'll make it in chapter 4. If it's of the physical seed, plural, descendants, then it has Ishmael has to include Esau so on and so forth but because he used seed and Paul by inspiration is identifying the seed as Christ you've got to be of Christ and notice he says the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed who is Christ the promise is made to Christ and so when we get to the end of chapter 3 and he talks about being baptized into Christ and put on Christ he says in verse 29 if you are Christ by being baptized into him you belong to him and therefore would be an heir of the promises made to him, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So there's a, I I recognize that's a deep concept, and I probably, you know, didn't do much justice to it. But it is powerful because we often make the point of plenary verbal inspiration. He made an argument based on the form of one word, and I think that's legitimate. Some suggest, I think blasphemously, that Paul is using a form of, Um, Jewish eisegesis where he's making an argument that's not actually found there in the text. That's not what he's doing. This is very sound reasoning uh, 
it's a very sound um, uh, exegesis. And so it's not of the law, but it's of the promise. So what is the purpose of the law uh, then? If it wasn't according to the law, what's the purpose of the law? To be a tutor. Um, so that word, tutor, and you know, all of this kind of comes together. So it's added because of the transgressions until the seed comes. He's the focus. Until he comes, here's this tutor. Here's this, um, as he'll say in chapter 4, guardian to do with the same. He says that you were uh, kept under guard, verse 23, and he uses that word tutor in verse 24. And the idea is that you were shut up under the law as one who is in sin, and you were not able to be without sin, freed from that bondage, except in Christ. So that's the point. The law is going to teach you that you need justification in another place. And if anything comes before Christ, which would free you from that bondage, from that state of sinfulness before God, then it must be that salvation is not by faith in Christ. It's, you can be saved by some other means. But that's what he's saying. As long as you were under the law, you were in need of justification through faith by another means. And that was Christ. So when Christ came, the purpose came, the faith being the standard object of faith in that section, then the law is served its purpose and it's done away with. And so it's not that the law and justification by faith are in competition. It's this binding of the old law to be saved, and that was never its purpose that is the problem. The law served its purpose, and Paul's perfectly fine with the law, but he's not fine with binding the law for salvation now. Yes, very quickly. And Romans 4, he points out that it was even before circumcision, much less the law, 430 years later. Great point. All right. I'm sorry we didn't get through that, but uh, JT may try to pick up with some of that. Um, but it's a familiar text to us anyway. Thank you for your attention. Chapter 4 questions are up here. I knew I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> yeah. my heart. Lord, I need you, for I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need 
Your sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. You passed the Good evening. It's time to begin. Our first song will be song number 442, Yield Not to Temptation. <clears throat> We're going to sing this um, just a little faster than we normally sing it. <clears throat> 
Good evening. If you would, please turn with me to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 24. That's going to be the main text of tonight's invitation. But before I talk about the passage, I'd like to give some context to it. Christians were under great persecution, and they began to scatter, preaching the message of God. One of those Christians was Philip, and he traveled down to Samaria. And in Samaria was a man named Simon, and he practiced magic. He had all the people amazed with what he could do. And in verses 12 through 13, we see that him, along with many others, believed and were baptized after hearing Philip preach the good news. So I'll start reading in verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you said, have said may come upon me. What I'd like to focus on is back in verse 13. We see that Simon believed and was baptized. And even though he was saved, he still sinned. And that sin separated him from God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. So that he does not hear. These verses we just read alone do disprove all theories of once saved, always saved. So what does it mean? How do we come back to Christ when we've let him down? How can we still receive the gift of heaven? Because all of us are guilty of sin in first John two, verse one. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The answer is repentance. Verse 22, Peter told him, Repent, therefore, the wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. And Simon did that. He asked Peter to pray for him. And that's exactly what me and you need to do if we find ourselves in sin. 1 John 1, 9 through 10 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is a merciful God, and he wants to forgive us of everything we've done, and he will. Psalms 145, 8 through 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All we have to do is ask him for it. Ask him for the forgiveness of the sin that we committed. If you're here tonight and you have not been saved through baptism, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do so. If you have been saved, but you've fallen short like Simon, separated yourself from God through sin, follow in his example and ask for forgiveness with a humble heart. And if you have sinned publicly and you need the prayers of the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs> 
Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord.